Well, I hate to see the educational portion of our summit come to an end. I am just so excited for our next and final educational session of our weekend, uh, Living Well with Prostate Cancer. Uh, our survivorship session is sponsored by AstraZeneca. So a huge thank you to AstraZeneca for all of your support. Um, this will actually be a presentation followed by a panel discussion. We are joined by uh, two of our amazing patients um, who will join us at the end of the presentation for um, a nice question and answer session and panel discussion. So be sure that you put any questions that you have into the chat box and we'll get to those. So we will begin with Dr. Alicia Morgans. Dr. Morgans is the medical director of the Dana-Farber Adult Survivorship Program. Dr. Morgans is also the chair of Zero's Medical Advisory Board and a longtime speaker and friend of Zero and the Zero Prostate Cancer Summit. So Dr. Morgans, thanks so much for joining us on your Sunday. Thank you so much, Shelby. And of course, thank you to the patients who are participating in this session. This first piece is really just an overview of some of the complications that patients may face when they're being treated for prostate cancer or after a prostate cancer diagnosis. This is definitely just a starting point. And that's one of the reasons we have some great patients here to help us think through uh, some of these in more detail and more in depth. These are my disclosures. Oh, these are my disclosures. And here is an outline. We will start with some background and move on to medical complications. Uh, then we'll talk through some psychological complications, other effects and complications, and a summary. And like I said, we will follow all of this with some really important um, patient engagement. So the, the background that I wanted to mention is really that the medical complications of androgen deprivation therapy, which is the most commonly used systemic treatment for prostate cancer, are centered around what we can see here on the screen, which I think um, actually seems quite complex if you're not used to looking at some of these diagrams, but let's walk through it. Remember, androgen deprivation therapy, or ADT, is really just a fancy way of saying that we're going to try to lower testosterone in an individual's body. And the purpose of this is to starve prostate cancer cells of the food or the fuel that they're trying to use to grow, to spread, to, to cause trouble. Um, it's just their way of surviving. It is what they eat. So if we're able to turn that hormone off, we're not producing it or we're blocking it from being used, we are in an effect shutting down prostate cancer cells and really starving them, which is a very important uh, way for us to use medicines to treat prostate cancer. The treatments that we use most commonly are either pills or injections that act on the pituitary gland, which is sort of the center of this whole diagram. And these medicines stop the signals that normally go between the pituitary gland and the testes that tell those to the testes to make testosterone. When we stop that signal, you can see the red arrow shows that the testes stop making testosterone. It goes way down. But in men, we all know that men have testosterone that's actually converted into estrogens because all men and all women have both testosterones and estrogen hormones in our systems. So when men's testosterone goes down, there's less testosterone to convert into estrogens. And when that happens, men have both low testosterone testosterone and low estrogen. And the combination of lowering both of these hormones is what leads to the side effects that we're going to talk through, at least those related to medical treatment with androgen deprivation therapy. Just to put this into context, about half of men with prostate cancer will be treated with androgen deprivation therapy at some point in their disease history. Sometimes that's at the time of initial diagnosis, maybe before or during radiation treatment. Sometimes it's if the cancer has come back or if a man's diagnosed with metastatic prostate cancer from the get-go, it can be used for years to try to help reduce complications and help that individual man live longer. So lots of reasons we use androgen deprivation therapy, but it acts this way. It lowers testosterone and it lowers estrogens. So what does that do to the body? Well, let's also think about 
people. Uh, people in general have to think about a lot of medical things, not just prostate cancer. And men in the United States find themselves facing cardiovascular disease as the most common cause of mortality or death in men as they age. We know that aging is, of course, one of the main risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And men with prostate cancer aren't any different. They're also facing cardiovascular disease just as they're facing prostate cancer. So why is this of particular importance? Well, one of the reasons is that ADT, you know, those medicines that lower testosterone and lower estrogens actually increase risk factors associated with cardiovascular disease. And here we can see two CT scans, and we'll look at them a little bit later because I think they're really helpful for us to think through what people are facing. On the left is a CT scan, which is basically a cut through the middle of a person. We're looking at um, that person lying on his back. We can see the pelvis bones, those white things that kind of flare out on the bottom back, um, just like as if they're little wings, but those are the hip bones or the pelvis bones in the back. And you can see those kind of big muscles, those gray muscles between those hip bones. Um, and you can see that if you look at the front or the, the top part of figure A, you can see pretty thick uh, gray colored, dark gray colored muscles around the anterior abdomen. This person looks like he basically has a little bit of a six pack there. And he has a thin layer of dark gray black that goes around those dark or, or sort of lighter gray muscles there. And that's a thin layer of fat tissue, which we all have. This person in panel A has not had androgen deprivation therapy yet. If we uh, slide over to panel B, this person has had androgen deprivation therapy. That dark gray around the, uh, the entire uh, body there has gotten a lot thicker. That's because androgen deprivation therapy makes us gain fat around the middle. The big muscles that we see between those hip bones in the back have gotten smaller. And that's because the muscles that we have have also shrink in the setting of androgen deprivation therapy, especially if we're not exercising and taking strides to make sure we maintain those muscles. So these pictures, I think, illustrate some of the changes that happen with androgen deprivation therapy. These are also risk factors for the development of cardiovascular disease. Other things to think about, increased total cholesterol levels, increased triglycerides. Um, I mentioned that anterior abdominal ad adipose tissue, which is basically fat tissue, which is normal and we all have it, but it gets bigger and that can be a risk for cardiovascular disease. Impaired glucose metabolism, we'll talk about that. That's another way of saying increasing the risk of diabetes and then weight gain. So if we think about all guys with prostate cancer, do they generally have good cardiovascular risk factors? Do they generally not? I think to put this into context, we should remember that individuals with prostate cancer are in many cases older men with the median age or the average age of men being diagnosed with prostate cancer in the late 60s, so usually around 67 or 68. So this is a population of people in general who do have higher risk of things like cardiovascular disease. Uh, there was a study a few years ago that looked at 100 men with prostate cancer who walked into a urology clinic and tried to figure out what is their risk of cardiovascular disease, just so we can put a number on it and try to understand, in general, is this population one that's at risk for cardiovascular events? What they found is of this 100 people, 58% had high blood pressure, 51% had cholesterol that was high, 17% had diabetes, um, and there were a, a number of men who actually had a cardiovascular or heart history with 17% having coronary artery disease needing a stent in one of their arteries around their heart or a cabbage, which is bypass surgery for a heart disease. And only four people out of that whole 100 didn't have any risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So it's really something that overlaps very much with prostate cancer. Um, and I think we need to keep in mind. So Here's just some more data that suggests or demonstrates that the combination of androgen deprivation therapy and increasing age really synergize to increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. And one of the other pieces that I didn't show information on, but you should know, is that people with a cardiovascular history 
plus this increasing age, plus androgen deprivation therapy are just at higher risk. So what does that really mean for people with prostate cancer? This is not a reason in most cases to not use the medicines that we know are highly effective against prostate cancer. It is a reason to talk to your doctor about your risk, about your risk factors, and to make sure that the modifiable or changeable risk factors that you have for cardiovascular disease are being addressed. And we all know that those can be addressed and that's what these guidelines are telling doctors. It's explaining that we should work as a multidisciplinary care team and engage primary care doctors and cardiologists and cardio-oncologists and others with the urologist, with the medical oncologist to work together to keep the person, the patient safe. And there's a really strategic way to think through this and we'll go through this table very briefly. This table is using a systematic way to think about those reversible or modifiable risk factors for cardiovascular disease in an easy A, B, C, D, E format, because even doctors need tricks for their memory, especially doctors maybe need tr tricks for their memory. So the way we think about it first with A is being aware that cardiovascular disease is something that we can affect and it is something to know about when we're using androgen deprivation therapy. B is making sure blood pressure is in a good range. And this is generally considered to be somewhere around 130 over 80 to 90. Um, we wanna try to keep blood pressure in that range, not 150, not 170, um, and not really 90, 100. We wanna keep it down into a, a, a better range there. We can think about and address cholesterol and make sure that good cholesterol is high and bad cholesterol and triglycerides are on the lower side. And we can use diet and weight management to make sure that we're eating a heart healthy diet, which is also a prostate healthy diet. That means lots of green vegetables, lots of grains that are high in fiber. And it also means limiting red meats and saturated fats to try again to keep that heart healthy. And of course, to use exercise, which is E. So this is one of the things that we um, had on that ABCDE that I didn't mention. I mentioned diet, but also D stands for diabetes because ADT is also associated with something called insulin resistance. What this means in, in regular language is just that um, over time, your insulin can be high and insulin is what gets sugar to go into your muscle cells to be able to power your muscles and do what we need to do. And when we eat sh foods with sugar um, or, or grains or fruits, these are all things that have sugar. Um, we need insulin to get the sugar out of our blood and put it into our muscles or into storage. Well, insulin is what does that. It's what helps to get that sugar out of our blood. And over time, if we are developing insulin resistance or pre-diabetes, even though we have high levels of insulin, we're not getting the sugar out of our blood. And so that leads to this high sugar in your blood, which leads to lots of complications and over time can lead to a diagnosis of diabetes. We know that ADT is associated with the development of this insulin resistance. And it's a relatively small risk, just like the cardiovascular risk that I mentioned, but it can be enough to push people over the edge if we don't pay attention to it. There was a study a number of years ago that showed that those people who were on androgen deprivation therapy or ADT had about a 36% higher chance of being diagnosed with diabetes within the year after using ADT. Now that is not something, that is not a risk that I have seen in my clinic at that high rate. This was a population at risk and this is not something to say that when you go into your clinic, if somebody's going to give you ADT, don't use it because that's not, that is not at all what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that this is another one of those risks that we have to think about and talk about with our doctors, that we have to use diet and exercise and, and really managing ourselves and making sure that our doctor's checking and, and making sure that we're not developing early signs of insulin resistance, which is possible. Here's another uh, figure to demonstrate that as you have long-term exposure to ADT and your age goes up, that's another synergistic risk factor to increase your risk of diabetes. And so here again, we have these guidelines to help us as doctors and to help patients try to keep themselves well. And we, again, really rely on the multidisciplinary approach and that A, B, C, D, E paradigm or system to think through how do we deal with 
the development of diabetes or insulin resistance? Well, we use the primary care doctor team. We work with geriatricians, endocrinologists, any specialists who might have this kind of expertise and make sure that we're screening and testing people and making sure that if they have a high blood sugar, even though they're fasting, for example, or a high hemoglobin A1C, which is a screening test for diabetes, that we look into it further and we make sure we understand if that person is starting to develop insulin resistance, prediabetes, or diabetes itself. We can use exercise and dietary management to try to address that. What about bones, which is actually something that it, these are highly affected, but really asymptomatic or no sim, you wouldn't feel any symptoms if your bones are thinning, but they can be getting thin with exposure to ADT. Um, importantly, osteoporosis is not only an issue that women face. Men who are being exposed to ADT also have thinning of the bones. And the reason for this is that the estrogen levels in men are going down and estrogen levels, just like in women, really regulate bone buildup and bone breakdown in our bones. It is a normal and healthy thing for our bones to always be rebuilding themselves and breaking themselves down to have good, healthy, strong bone. When we have some, we're using ADT, we are shifting estrogen levels and that shift causes the bones to break down more than they build up. And so over time and over exposure to ADT, the bones will ultimately start to break down and people can start to get thinner bones and ultimately develop osteoporosis. That can put us at risk for fracture. And importantly, fractures don't only happen related to osteoporosis in women. About 20 to 25% happen in men around the world. And also importantly, a fracture is a big deal about the risk of death within the first six months after a hip fracture, for example, is actually twice as high in men as it is in women. Hip fractures can cause a loss of mobility. They can cause a loss of independence and a feeling of developing financial burden on family members because you're not able to really fend for yourself. And so preventing fractures, especially hip fractures, is really, really of high importance. So what do the guidelines tell us about that? Well, the bone health guidelines really tell us to be proactive about this, just as we are with those reversible risk factors related to cardiovascular disease. It suggests that men who are on ADT take supplemental calcium and vitamin D every day, in addition to what they're getting in their diet, to make sure that the bones have the building blocks that they need for that rebuilding process. There are also going to be guys who are at higher risk. ADT alone is a risk factor for developing osteoporosis. So that puts you one notch ahead in terms of those risk factors for developing osteoporosis. But additional risk factors include being elderly, and typically that would be thought of as over 70 or so in the bone health world, um, heavy alcohol use, which is defined for men as more than two drinks a day, current smoking, and sustained exposure to steroids, which can also happen with some of our treatments for prostate cancer. So what about the psychological complications? Because this is no small thing to be diagnosed with prostate cancer. Well, we know that depression is an issue across the entire country. And I would say it's an issue around the world, particularly as we're all coping with a pandemic that is, has been lingering for a few years. This study was done a few years ago and demonstrated that depression is actually really common across our country. And it is especially common among individuals who are diagnosed with cancer, with about 40% of people having cancer having depression at some point in their experience. So this is not uncommon. And I would say that's one of the most important messages of this, of this conversation and this talk. In addition to not being uncommon, it is something that we can treat if we recognize it and if we bring it to the attention of our medical team. So really, really important to say something, even though this can be one of the hardest things to talk about. We know that ADT also increases the risk of depression in men with prostate cancer. This figure shows that men who have been exposed to ADT in the yellow line have a higher rate of developing depression as compared to men in the blue line who are not exposed to ADT. And all men in this figure have a diagnosis of prostate cancer. So we're showing about a 23% increased risk of developing depression because of that exposure to ADT. 
We also know that ADT in some studies is suggested to contribute to mild cognitive impairment or even the development of dementia. This is very, very difficult to prove. And there are studies that are ongoing to try to understand if this is happening in patients. And I would say of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of men that I've treated with ADT, the development of dementia related only to the ADT is very rare. But what I think may be happening is that people maybe who are at risk already for dementia may be at higher risk of having it accelerated in some settings related to ADT. Though again, this is not proven and is something that is still being investigated. In this particular study, this study found that patients who, um, did, not, who, who did not get treated with ADT had actually an improvement in their cognitive scores or the scores that they had had on some brain game tests over time, over the course of a year. Whereas patients who were getting treated with ADT had a stabilization or slight worsening over that year. So the patients who did not have ADT basically learned how to take the test over the year. The guys who were treated with ADT really didn't learn how to do the tests any better over that time period. That led to a difference at a year that suggested that there was some more cognitive decline or mild cognitive impairment after 12 months in those patients getting ADT. So this question is still outstanding, one that we're still investigating pretty intensely, and we hope to have more information to share with you over time here. But the guidelines, again, give us some direction, at least when it comes to depression. Cognitive change is more challenging. What they suggest is that we as doctors, family members, and patients themselves should be thinking about depression, should be thinking about, am I feeling a low mood? Am I more argumentative? Am I having trouble with sleeping? Am I, or am I sleeping too much? Is my appetite going up or is it going way down? These can all be signs of the constellation of symptoms that actually indicate a, depre a, a, a depression or depressed mood. And so we really importantly want to screen for this and make sure that we diagnose people if that is what they are developing. There are absolutely effective treatments for depression, whether those are medicines, whether they're counseling, Whatever they are, there are multiple things we can do, and we want to make sure that you ask about them because there's something that we can do and you can feel better. So very, very important there. When it comes to cognitive change, there are fewer screening ways to screen. There are fewer things that we might be able to do with an easy pill, but there are behavioral tricks that people can learn if they get the diagnosis that they need. And there are medicines for de dementia as well. Um, so we'd want to make sure that you bring that up with your doctor if you feel like you're, you're having some change and really get to a neurologist who can help you understand what's going on more clearly. Let's go into some final effects and considerations. And these are related to uh, more to treatment with radiation or to surgery than with ADT. Um, but there's this general constellation that I wanted to mention one more time, fatigue, weight gain, and loss of muscle mass that can be related to ADT or can just be after all this treatment, this sort of fatigue cycle that sets in, especially in the setting of low testosterone, as I said. Um, and we wanna make sure that if you are having low testosterone and, and then developing fatigue and weight gain, or if you're just getting fatigue and weight gain after your treatment, we really need to emphasize that exercise a little bit each day and hopefully increasing over time can be so important and so helpful in combating fatigue. Um, it's also really, really good for bone health. Weight bearing activities keep the bones strong because of the pressure that you have, even with every step of your foot on the concrete, if you're walking outside, that puts a little pressure on your bones and makes them build up. And a healthy diet is really helpful here too for fatigue and weight gain. Incontinence issues um, absolutely happening most commonly after surgery. Um, usually after radiation, we have more we see more symptoms of urinary urgency, like I gotta go right when you gotta go, you've got to go right then. Um, or urgency, that's the urgency or frequency going many times a day or many times a night. But real incontinence happens most commonly after surgery. This can be treated with Kegel exercises or strengthening the pelvic floor, behavioral modifications. So thinking about not drinking fluid if you're going to be out all day and need to make sure that you don't, it, because you don't have access to a, a restroom perhaps, or not drinking as much within the few hours before bed so you don't have leakage overnight. Um, certainly people can use things like pads and depends. There are also medications that can help with 
those symptoms of urinary urgency. And there are penile clamps, as you can see in the middle picture here, that um, uh, can be used. And some people use them very, very effectively. And there are also things like a male sling or an artificial urinary sphincter, which is up in that right side of that, that um, of this slide, that can be done with the urologist that can be very, very helpful in stopping in issues of incontinence because these can be really, really limiting for people. And again, we have treatments that we can use. And so it's really important to explore this with your urologist. Sexual dysfunction can happen to any patient after prostate cancer related to radiation, related to surgery, related to hormonal therapy, or just related to the experience. And, and there are many causes of sexual dysfunction. They can be anatomic, because of the nerves being um, cut in a surgery or because those nerves were radiated. They can be due to loss of libido or sex drive when you're taking androgen deprivation therapy or because it's harder to get an erection when you have a, you're taking androgen deprivation therapy. They can be due to psychological stress because of that cancer diagnosis or the treatment and what you're going through. There are so many things that can contribute here. And really, I would say, Admitting that there's a problem and then talking to someone about it is the first step because you have to underlie, understand the underlying causes so that we can help identify the solution because the solution is really going to be directed towards the cause. So here we have medications that can be by mouth. You can use injectable medications. There's a picture here of a vacuum erection device or a vacuum pump that can be used to physically help support an erection. There are surgeries that can insert a penile prosthesis, which is uh, inconsistency, feels kind of like a breast implant, but has a pump that is, sits inside the scrotum that can be used to pump up and then pump down the erection. Um, and then there are other, of course, ways that you can share intimacy with your partner partner outside of, of erections. And so that can also be explored through counseling or through conversations with your partner. Um, there are couples counselors, sexual health experts and therapists and other therapists who can help with all of this. So this has been a whirlwind tour around some of the issues that people face. There, this was not all encompassing. There are certainly more and I'm excited to talk to our um, my patient colleagues here so we can think through some of them. But just to recap, Prostate cancer patients living with or after hormonal treatments are at risk for multiple medical and other complications. So thinking about heart, bones, muscles, blood sugar, mood, and other systemic things are, that can be affected is important. And talking to your doctor is important because awareness is the first step. Prostate cancer patients recovering after surgery or radiation are at risk for sexual dysfunction, urinary continent, incontinence, fatigue, and other symptoms. So again, bringing those to the attention of your doctor can be really, really helpful. There are ways to prevent or reverse these effects, and that's also important to know. Exercise, a heart-healthy diet, and working with primary care doctors can maximize your health and is absolutely, I would say, a cornerstone in, in everybody's um, way moving forward in terms of feeling better. And talking with loved ones about what you need and what they need is critical because we're not we're all in this together um, and making sure that you have that support system, know what you need and who, who you are and how you can help them and how they can help you is I think one step forward in trying to feel better. So, um, so that is all I uh, really wanted to, to talk about. Um, we certainly have time for questions and I'm gonna stop sharing so we can get everybody on the screen here. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Morgans. And while we get everyone to join us on the screen, I would just wanted to share a, a comment with you that came in in the uh, in the platform, and and uh, this gentleman said, "I wish every doctor who prescribed ADT and every patient who is prescribed ADT would be forced to listen to this talk. It's one of the best ever." So just a, a little kudos to you, and and really just a, I think a testament to how important survivorship is, and talking about it, and, and being empowered to have these conversations with your loved ones and with your partners and um, with your providers, certainly. So, so thank you for that. Well, thank you. That was, that's very kind. Um, and I, I really appreciate that. We all need words of encouragement. We do. Uh, <laughs> after getting, giving a talk. So, um, so thank you very much. And, and I wonder, um, Daryl and Derek, if, if either of you could start us off as we're waiting for some questions. I know um, you, both of you have had some different experiences and I'd love to hear um, some of the things that were most bothersome and then maybe most helpful for each of you. Maybe we can start with Derek. Sure, how are you doing? 
Doing well. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. How are you? That was a pretty well, thanks. And thank you for the presentation. That was a really nice, thorough overview of the different side effects and just the, the treatment alone of ADT. Uh, I learned quite a few things that I did not know, which are hopefully uh, the people attending this can walk away with that, that information. Um, my situation was a little different. I actually had um, a radical prostatectomy, so I didn't have to go the hormonal treatment. Um, I was very proactive uh, in my regimen as far as my prostate cancer journey. It's one of those things. Uh, I come from three generations of prostate cancer, and you know, the three generations, my father, my uncle, myself, uh, have survived it. And I just literally found out this past Thursday, my brother was diagnosed with prostate cancer. So it really is a family affair uh, moving forward. But I think the proactiveness has been a, a key part of really understanding what uh, options are out there, the ADT, the uh, other treatments that you mentioned as well, because you really need to understand what's really good for you and your family and what's going to help you with the longevity of life. As we look at helping men to re be more proactive with uh, their prostate health, as you mentioned, the exercise and the eating, the diet, all those things come into play. And for me, I was um, I was one of those asymptomatic. So I have a pretty good, uh, a solid regiment and workout where I was doing roughly 50 to 75 miles a week on my bike. I'm a martial arts instructor. So I had a very active lifestyle. And it was the, um, the notice of my PSA rise and knowing my numbers and checking them and see how they were changing. Then I knew that there was something going on. So I really had to start at that particular point, understanding and really looking at seeking the treatment that was going to be best for me and my family. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I'm so sorry to hear about your brother. I'm glad he has an advocate in you to help him navigate things because it is it is not easy, but, uh, but um, I'm sorry to hear it nonetheless. Thank you. Uh, uh, and Daryl, I wonder if you can share a little bit about your perspectives. You know, what, what did you go through um, and what was the most bothersome of, of what you experienced and maybe how did you deal with it? Well, I've been, uh using ADT since the year 2000. That's when I had a radical prostatectomy and also radiation. Um, it didn't really get my numbers down to a point where they needed to be. So then we st started, uh, I think I took uh, the ADT for probably about a year. I was doing Lupron shots or Lupron shots at the time. And uh, I responded very well to them. It, it uh, you know, took my PSA numbers down to nothing and, and I felt better. I mean, obviously the the, the loss of loss of you know sexual urgency was probably the biggest change. I, I had some hot flashes and some problems related to the ADT, but nothing. I, I didn't have a lot of fatigue or a lot of weight gain or a lot of the, the problems that you addressed earlier. But I mean, I did have the depression issues, and I mean, uh, you know, it, it's a roller coaster. Some sometimes you feel great, sometimes you feel terrible. There were times when my attitude was the only thing I had to feel good about. I, I you know, I was just you know, really couldn't shake it. And, you know, with the help of loved ones and others, you kind of, you know, you need those support mechanisms. You need those people to help you out and to help you be stronger. And, and you know, a couple of years of, of the ADT treatment, it was like, I would feel better. We'd go off the ADT for a while and, you know, generally I'd be on for a couple of years and off for a couple of years. And I would kind of return to almost a normal situation, but I still had some, you know, I still had a lot of the, you know, the, emotional problems that go along with it. I mean, I, 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 you know, would advise anybody that goes into this, it's not something where you're going to ever really be able to live, you know, the life you knew previously. It's, 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 but it is living and there are things to, to live for and to feel better about yourself. And, and it's, it's worth the trouble right now. I just, uh, we kind of had a relapse about, Oh, six months ago, they, uh, they told me that my numbers were going up. So it's sort of scared and depressed me even more, obviously. And, I was able to um, go and get and see some very good doctors. And, and what I was advised was to go for a round of, of radiation, which seems to have uh, worked, worked, its, worked its magic and, and my numbers are starting to go down again. So I'm hoping that I can kind of return to that same situation where I could at least forget that I have prostate cancer and forget that I'll ever have to deal with this, you know, or, or, or I know I'll have to deal with this again, but I want to, kind of put it out of my mind for like right now. So that's kind of the situation I'm in right now. And, you know, like I said, ADT probably saved my life and, and it works, it works wonders. And I mean, it just instantly drop your numbers instantly drop when you take it. And yes, there are some risk factors, but in, indeed it is worth it to take the, the ADT. So. 
Thank you for that, Daryl. And, um, and that is absolutely one of the messages I want to make sure is clear. ADT is the backbone of everything we do medically with, with medicines, I should say, in the treatment of prostate cancer. And it's been that way for decades and decades and decades. And it is highly effective. Um, it's just important, I think, as we are using any medication, whether it's ADT or Tylenol, that we understand the risks that come along with that because there's something we can do for that. And I, um, and so I would never say that the risks of the complications outweigh the benefits of the treatment for, for, for a patient whose doctor is saying this is the important right next step. Um, but I always think when I do talk to patients, when we are thinking about making that step, as you mentioned, to go on, to go off, you know, is it the right time to go on? Is this the right treatment? Is it really necessary? If it's not, then, then that's an important conversation conversation to have too. Um, but if it is really necessary, it's worth it. Just knowing the risks so you can do something about it, I think is, is important for, for any of us. Um, and I wonder, and I, um, and I know this can actually be a really sensitive topic and so don't want to put anyone on the spot. So anyone who wishes to, to say something can, but um, mental health has been at the forefront of a lot of our thoughts um, whether it's because we're, you know, healthcare providers caring for people with COVID, whether it's because we, I work with people who have cancer and, and obviously they have a lot on their mind and there's a reason to have mental health concerns. Um, I think it has come more into the forefront in the last few years, but importantly, it has had a, there's been a stigma around mental health and about asking for help. Um, I even remember, remember feeling, um, those stigmas, as I was growing up, I remember hearing things about that, even on the news or on sitcoms, and it's, it's something that's ingrained into our culture. And I, I really feel like that's changing as we're all um, thinking about it more personally in, in what we've experienced with the pandemic. And I hope that that's the case. Um, and and I, I really just wanna emphasize that we have phenomenal treatments for depression, for anxiety. We have support groups, we have therapists, we have a lot of different ways of dealing with this. And I wonder if either of you, either in your own experiences or in counseling friends who have had concerns about prostate cancer, have any advice on how to support your mental health while trying to run the marathon of, of a diagnosis with, um, with prostate cancer? Yeah, I, I think the mental health piece is very important. And it's one of those things, prostate cancer or cancer, any cancer by itself is something you don't want to do alone. I was very fortunate to have my wife, Diane, my father, who's a 27-year prostate cancer survivor, go through this and kind of understand the highs and the lows of what they've gone through for the mental aspect and talking to other prostate cancer survivors, depression, the anxiety, the stress. It's not just the man that goes through this. It's also your wife or your spouse because it is shared experience. You're, you're going through it. If you're feeling it, your spouse or your mate are also feeling it as well. And I think the talking about it and understanding and even looking at those support groups that may be out there to help with uh, cancer survivorship, it's also important to gauge and talk to other men. Uh, one of the things we do with our nonprofit is really help men to talk and encourage other men to be proactive and talk through those things, such as the incontinence, the rectal dysfunction, really understand what they're going through and places they may be able to seek to get help. But the first step is really talking about it and expressing that you are in distress or have an issue that you're trying to deal with and not try to deal with it on your own. I think that it goes a long ways to really help. But most of all, you know, your spouse is going to be your cheerleader and the one that's going to help you get through a lot of things. Eric, Daryl, do you have anything you wanted to add? No, I just I just wanted to say I probably have, have the most benefit I've gotten is just just the support of friends talking about it. It's it's a hard thing to talk about because, you know, I mean, it, it discusses a lot of very sensitive things that guys don't like to talk about. It's the worst thing that really can happen to a guy. So, I mean, being able to talk about it does does get it off your chest. Uh, being able to put it out of your mind sometimes I think is important, too. I mean, you can't go through life just, you know, surrounding yourself with the problems and the, the ordeals of, of having prostate cancer. Life goes on and you got to kind of pick yourself up and, and do the, you know, do the things that you need to do to feel good about yourself. You need to do the exercise. You need to do the, uh, you know, make friends, you know, I'm, like right now I'm just going out and traveling. I'm a retired person and I'm having the time of my life and I'm just sort of forgetting right now that I've got a problem with cancer right now. And I think, that's my, been my best medicine. 
Daryl, um, I think we're about to wrap up, but I want to just emphasize that one of the most important things is to be able, I think, to put prostate cancer outside of your front and center thoughts, um, at least, you know, most of your day. I mean, you do not need, in most cases, to think about prostate cancer all of the time. It is something, it is a part of your life. It is not, does not have to run your life. And, um, and none of us can face that all the time, front and center, um, and we don't need to. So I, I love that. Focusing on traveling, that, ooh, that sounds lovely to me, Daryl. Um, I would love to travel again, too. I'm looking forward to a summer of travel. Um, and I think all of us should look forward to summer with friends, with family, um, and not putting prostate cancer right here all the time. Put it behind you when you can and enjoy your life because you can live well with prostate cancer. Um, and I want to turn it back to Shelby because I think that we are out of time. Thanks, Thank Dr. You. Morgan. Yeah, thanks, Daryl. Thanks, Derek. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. If you can um, stay with us for a, a couple of more minutes before we wrap up, I think maybe we can sneak in one or two of these questions. But um, Dr. Morgan's, we did have a question come in in the chat. Um, we talked a lot about low levels of testosterone and, and what that looks like. Can you share a little bit about what it looks like to have high levels of testosterone, even post um, ADT? So when ADT stops, we hope that men's testosterone levels will recover. That's part of feeling normal, having more energy, having um, muscle mass be, you know, be a little bit stronger um, for the same amount of exercise, you can build more muscle mass. Um, usually we, do, we, we don't generally say for people who have had prostate cancer that they should take high levels of testosterone um, and, and make their testosterone levels go really high. There are some clinical trials that are looking at that, but I wouldn't suggest that outside of that sort of very controlled environment where, where a doctor is monitoring very closely to make sure that everything's okay. Um, we are, I think, in some situations um, for men who have a lot of symptoms and side effects related to low testosterone, even though they're no longer on ADT, and if those men had a low-risk prostate cancer and it was in the past, say, five years or so before, sometimes we are, we are thinking about supplementing uh, testosterone for those men to try to get them back to a normal level, but that is also something that I would say needs to be done under a very... Um, close supervision with a doctor really monitoring because we don't know, especially for people who didn't have just a low risk prostate cancer, whether um, cancer cells that may still be present at some low level might be stimulated by adding that testosterone back. So these are conversations that um, they, so testosterone can be helpful in terms of energy and muscle mass and, and all of that. The physique that, that you had when you were 20 came from your testosterone. But, um, but I think it has to be conversations with an individual talking to his physician because um, there can be a lot of risks related to adding testosterone back in the setting of a prior prostate cancer. Great, thank you. Um, we, do, we have one more question, um, if, if that's fine, and, and it's uh, about treating osteoporosis both maybe before androgen deprivation therapy and during, um, and, and maybe what treatments might be recommended. Obviously, you don't know this person's um, exact situation and diagnosis, but if you could speak generally to that. Sure. So calcium, 1,200 milligrams a day, and vitamin D, 800 to 1,000 units a day are what's recommended to have the building blocks there for your bones, for your bones to do their job and put those pieces, the bricks and the mortar, the calcium or the bricks, the vitamin D's, the mortar, put it back into your bones. For people who are at high risk of fracture, and I mentioned some risk factors in my talk, there are extra medicines that we can use either every six months or once a year, depending on the medicine that we use, soledronic acid or denosumab, and those medicines help push the calcium and the vitamin D into the bones faster and can be really helpful. We use those medicines to treat osteoporosis, whether it's in men or in women. Um, so those those can be useful, but again, that's really just reserved for the people who already are developing pre-osteoporosis called osteopenia or osteoporosis, or if they're at very high risk. And so talking to your doctor about whether that may apply to you is, is, uh, is the way that I would go. Great. Thank you. And then I think just one last question, and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. Um, Dr. Morgan's this patient is wondering if ADT 
might play a role in uh, atrial fibrillation? So that's, that's a great question. We don't usually think of ADT disrupting the electricity in the heart. So atrial fibrillation happens because um, there is usually uh, the electricity in the heart has a little um, excitable part of it. So it usually goes through this little electric circuit to, to pump very um, regularly and make your, your atria pump the pump and then the ventricles pump and it all is supposed to happen in concert so that blood goes through your lungs and then blood goes through the rest of your body. In atrial fibrillation, the electricity is a little off. There's one part of that circuit that's a little bit excitable and it's just kind of firing, firing, firing instead of beat, 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 beat. It's beat, 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 beat. I, that sounds almost like a <laughs> jazz song or something. It's just a, it's just a mess. Um, in a, in a, not in a jazz good kind of way, it's a mess in a dysfunctional heart kind of a way. Usually we don't think of ADT as affecting the electricity. We think of it more as affecting the pumping or as affecting the cholesterol maybe in the, in the arteries. So the electricity is less affected. But I would talk to your cardiologist if you do think that there may be some relationship there. And there are some choices we can make about ADT that may have fewer effects on cardiac function. And maybe your, your doctor can put you on that type of ADT just in case there's a link to try to avoid any interference with the, the uh, atrial fibrillation. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Um, and I just want to thank Dr. Morgans again. Thank you very much for being here. Derek, Daryl, thank you for joining the panel, sharing your stories. I know that we didn't get a chance to really dive into each of your specific situations. Um, I, I know I, I had a chance to speak with you as we prepared for today's session. And, and I know, um, you know, the, the experiences that you've both gone through and are going through are so unique and just really thank you for sharing uh, with our attendees today. Thank you for the opportunity, greatly appreciate it. And, and I hope that every man listening to this can take away, there is life after prostate cancer with all the treatments and diagnosis and all the different options that they express. And Daryl with traveling, I, I, I'm in awe of what you're doing. This uh, is a perfect example of him and myself, you know, we're living our mm -hmm. lives and prostate cancer is something that we have had or are going through and we're, we're, we're moving beyond it. Yeah, well said, Derek, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to kind of talk and say say a few things. It kind of makes me feel better about uh, you know at least being able to make something positive out of something that's that's not really a positive thing, more of a negative thing. So thank you, yeah, Daryl. Definitely, Daryl, and thank you for taking uh, a few moments out of your travel to join us on a on a Sunday. We appreciate it. You're, you're welcome. I just got off a cruise about a half hour ago or so. So <laughs> I was. I, was I love that. That's day. amazing. You squeeze it in. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, thank you to everyone uh, for participating in our survivorship talk. Be sure to check out Dr. Morgan's bio in the speakers tab. Um, Daryl and Derek are also listed in our speakers tab um, since they are participants for our day. Uh, another thank you um, to AstraZeneca for sponsoring our session on survivorship. And again, please check out the uh, sponsor tab to learn more about AstraZeneca.